Hello and welcome to Move to Live, Live to Move. And this week I am chatting with Gwyn Wallace. Gwyn is back again. He's back for more. And I'm so glad that he has consented to come along because, you know, I had my hair done specially, Gwyn. <laughs> so did I. <laughs> yeah. And uh, today we are talking about breath. And, um, you know, if we haven't got the breath, then we're not going to be moving so well, are we? So it's uh, the foundational principles of Pilates is breath. One of the foundational principles of yoga is breath. And, uh, uh, and so we are here to talk about how to breathe better, how to breathe uh, more efficiently, how to um, maybe tackle some uh, issues that you might not have been even aware of when it comes to breath. And, uh, and so Gwyn is a physiotherapist and he is the man for the job. So <laughs> let's let's start with our favorite subject, which is uh, breathing through the nostrils, Gwyn. I've been practicing. And how has that been for you? Uh, well, do you know what? I must say that because I talk quite a lot, it's it's hard. And uh, and often I, I walk with my son and, you know, it's our chance to catch up on what's been going on in the world, uh, yeah. his world. And and so, yeah, you kind of you can't breathe through your nose and talk is what I am discovering. But uh, but I mean, it's not new to me, I must confess. It is something that I have uh, have been cognizant of for some time. And I am aware of the health benefits. Uh, and actually, I was listening to our mutual um, friend. I don't think we've ever met him. No. Patrick Patrick McEwen, is it? Is that? Yeah. yeah. And uh, he was talking all about uh, nose breathing and COVID-19. So, you know, this is a whole nother thing that we can talk about. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's... For me, unless you uh, uh, much my in terms of the same thing as Patrick says, if you're not breathing through your nose, then you're not breathing right. Um, over the last few months, I've been reflecting on on the importance of nasal breathing. You know, in terms of it being the first line of defence, the the impact that nitrous oxide has with it being um, with it being antiviral, and you know, in this viral climate. Can I just stop you there? Yeah. You you said nitrous oxide. Nitrous oxide, sorry. That's, yeah, no, that's okay because do you know what? I went and I looked it up. What is the difference? Nitrous, nitric, and uh, yeah, two nitrous oxygen molecules. <laughs> well, sorry? Two oxygen molecules, I think. Oh, yeah, well, I, I get that now. But uh, the difference is one is laughing gas, is it not? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Nitric <laughs> oxide. So, yeah, anyway, nitric oxide, that's right. You were saying. Yeah, um, you know, it, it's it's got obviously the antiviral properties, but then mm. again, it, it's also really important in terms of bronco and vasodilation of, of the lungs. So actually to improve the efficiency of your lungs as a mechanism, it, it's a really important clue tool that we, we can only realistically get access to by actually using nasal breathing. You know, so um, if you are not doing nasal breathing, you're not going to access to this and it is going to have a profound effect on the efficiency of your respiratory system. Mm. Yeah, I, that's right. And um, it, it, it is something that requires a little bit of practice, uh, you yeah. know, and then, of course, uh, doing it while you're exerting yourself, whether it's uh, walking <laughs> Uh, well, walking's more manageable, I must confess. Uh, I, I start off on my bike trying to do the nasal breathing. And then, you know, before long, I find myself puffing and panting through my, <laughs> through my mouth. But I tell you what, actually, do you know what? The other day I went for a walk and I was listening to an audio book and my son wasn't with me. And I did nasal breathing the whole time. And... Uh, and I looked back and I compared on my Fitbit um, my heart rate. Yep. 
And so what I found was that on the same, and pretty much, you know, I have a route that I walk and it's the same whether I'm with him or, or with my audio book. And I was, it was intriguing actually that I was getting up into the zones, higher heart rate zones when I was walking and talking uh, than I was when I was nasal breathing. Is that, is that right, would you say? Definitely, because... You know, you think about the relationship between the upper chest breathing and the sympathetic nervous system and the lower diaphragmatic breathing and the parasympathetic nervous system. Mm -hmm. If you're kicking into that parasympathetic, that's going to bring that heart rate down a lot. Plus also your breathing mechanics, you're going to be working harder by using upper chest breathing in your neck and shoulders than you will be by diaphragmatic breathing. So, so again, that's another you know significant impact of you know, breathing is not just about the act of taking great lumps of air into your lungs. There are a whole load of other physiological and physical things that can be influenced by how we breathe. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's interesting, isn't it? I was just looking, we had a comment here. I was just talking about how I want to be able to be able to breathe out of my nose for eight years because of my deviated septum oh she wasn't able to and post-surgery yeah. I feel like I'm having to learn how to breathe again well I mean that's the thought to be honest that yeah. is exactly the case uh, mm -hmm. you are actually having to to learn to use that organ again it's it's no different than you know if you break an ankle or something like that you've got to re relearn how to use that your, na your nose is experiencing trauma and by the same token it has to relearn to to use it to, to use it properly again. And, and there are a, a couple of techniques that you can use to help yourself with that. Um, there is a simple exercise that Patrick McKeon does in terms of nasal unblocking, which we can talk about later. Unilateral nasal breathing is another good way of doing it. And, and you mentioned the, the, the going for a walk. There is a, a really, there is a fun way of accessing and improving your nitric oxide, and that's by humming. Oh, yeah. So once you're going along walking and you're going at a gentle pace, do some humming because humming in itself will stimulate that nasal airway and produce more nitric oxide. So there, there are little tricks that you can use that, that will help you on that journey. But if you are a habitual mouth breather, it is a long journey. It's mm. not something that, that's going to change overnight. You know, one of my patients at the moment, um, she's been a mouth breather for all of her 31 years. You know, she's got that classic mm. history of as a child, she had lots of chest infections. She always had throat infections. She was always snotty. Um, my son was a similar sort of situation. I just wish I knew then what I now know mm. because it took him down a whole road of, you know, going and seeing speech and language therapy and all the rest of it because basically his tongue wasn't sitting in the right place. Mm. Because the tongue wasn't sitting in the right place, what, what then happens from a, physio, from a physio perspective is you start adopting this kind of posture. And the reason why you do that is so the tongue sits in a better place and isn't occluding your airways. Mm. What that then does is have a massive impact on the actual facial structure of your face. And you end up with a very narrow face because if you're nasal breathing, your tongue sits at the top part of your palate. If you're mouth breathing, it can't. And, you know, one of the things to do is, is just have mm. a look at mirror and see if you've actually got teeth crowding. See if you've had issues with, with sort of like lots of fillings or, you know, bad breath and all this sort of thing. And it's, these are some of the, the negative effects that mouth breathing actually can have. Yeah, well, so, I, I mean, the, ne the negative effects are, uh, yeah, not, not to be, what's the word? Uh, uh, it's something to be mindful of, you know. Yeah, if yeah. On well, a journey exactly. of, of, of trying to to look at their lives and trying to enhance their lives and and, and redesign themselves, particularly as we're going forward into a, a not necessarily a brave new world, but a transitioning world where people are going to be able to go out and do more activities. Mm. I think now is a really good time to be to be using new skills and drills to enhance the quality of your life. Well, I like that because I love anything that rhymes, you know, as it happens. Skills and drills. I, I like that. And strategy. That's a military thing. Yeah, is it? Okay. Yeah. Tools and techniques. Skills uh, and drills. Yeah. So skills and drills. I'm going to use that. I, I think, you know, maybe we've jumped a little bit ahead 
with uh, the nasal breathing uh, because you know what are the benefits over and above the nitrous nitric oxide we were talking about um yeah. it is that it accesses the diaphragm more readily definitely um, and therefore facilitate a deeper inhalation. Is that is that what we're talking? It, it does, but but one of the things I've been reflecting on in the last few weeks is is that deeper doesn't necessarily mean bigger. No. A lot of time when we use a language, um, when we talk about relaxation and mindfulness, we tell people to take a deep breath. Mm. Uh, for some people, that gets interpreted as a big breath. Mm. Yeah, so you you really end up with that, that hyperinflation around the top part of the chest as opposed to a deeper breath, meaning actually deep down here rather mm. than up here. And, and I think we just got to make sure that people are aware of when we talk about a deep breath, we're talking about that diaphragmatic breath rather than the mm. big breath. Yeah, I think that's a very important distinction because uh, certainly Patrick was talking, Patrick McCune was talking about uh, slow, quiet, uh, gentle breathing, so that it's uh, prolonged and uh, and efficient. I think is what we're talking about, rather than big. Uh, yeah. You know, so so yeah, that's a really important distinction to make because I I you know I'm guilty of having said big breath, take a big breath. <laughs> um, I, I, you probably find most physios have. Because we just talk in terms of, you know, thinking of the lungs as this big bag of air that we just fill up mm. and not actually thinking about the fact that we've got different lobes. The the, the blood is, is not equally distributed through through the lungs. It tends to be more in the bases. Mm. So as it's more in the bases, then basically if you're putting air up here and the blood's down here, you're not getting equal opportunity for gas exchange mm. the other thing to think about is if you're mouth breathing you tend to mm. breathe quicker if yeah. you're breathing quicker the air doesn't have as much time to do gas exchange mm. so you decrease the opportunity for gas exchange to occur that's right and we and we're talking about as well all the the dead space that yeah uh, you know and, and that takes time to uh the, the quicker we're breathing the more we're just filling the dead space where nothing's actually happening yeah so yeah. uh so yeah and the blood is pooling at the bottom because we are in a, a gravitational environment and uh, and so we want the air and the blood to get together for the uh for the gas gases <laughs> to have a party yeah. i mean one of the one of the other things that, that's really important with this is, is actually calm dioxide is critical to this as a process. Mm -hmm. um, I, I was having a discussion last week with RAF Athletics and we were discussing how that actually people training really, really hard and, and just taking big breaths actually wasn't helping them perform mm -hmm. because what they were doing was blowing off all the CO2 which actually then in terms of how hemoglobin works, hemoglobin is influenced by the acidity of your, your blood, which is dependent on carbon dioxide. Mm -hmm. So if you haven't got enough carbon dioxide within your system, then the oxygen isn't released from the hemoglobin into your tissues. So that means you're trying to work really, really hard, mm -hmm. really struggling, and your muscles are really fatiguing, but because you're over-breathing and you're getting rid of that carbon dioxide, that oxygen can't actually be released to the tissues. Yeah. Uh, for those of you who've done biology at one point, it, it's what's known as the Bohr shift. Oh, yes. What's called an oxygen dissociation curve. And, and if you're over breathing, you basically move that curve so that basically the hemoglobin just hangs on to oxygen because there's no, it, it physiologically doesn't you need to release it because mm. your CO2 levels are low. Yeah. So the CO2 levels drive that. And if we're yeah. hyper isolating that that's not happening to the same extent so so yeah this long slow uh inhalation through the nostrils to to send the air to the bases of the lungs where the blood lives and then uh you know similarly um i think you know we can talk about maybe some uh some techniques that uh, that might be helpful for people uh, you know, the breathing in the square. 
box breath box breathing is, is a, a really nice technique for, for some people in terms of where it gives them that idea of visualizing where the breath's coming from mm -hmm. uh, there's a, a, a gentleman called Leon Chato who's a, a, an osteopath who talked about the breathing wave and that idea that you could see that breath breath come from that abdominal diaphragm area and work up into the chest. And that's a really, really nice way of, of, of thinking about it. But box, mm -hmm. breathing, box breathing fits into that concept of a breathing wave that is developing from the bases going up. Yes. My other analogy, it's like a, a really skinny balloon. A what? You know, the blue, the really thin ones. Oh, okay. And it takes a long time to actually get that to work up. That's That for me is another way of thinking about it. But it's from a bottom down rather than a top. It's from a bottom up rather than a top down perspective. You know, yeah, that's how I'd like people to think of it. You know, is actually drawing it in from the basis and expanding up. Yeah, okay. and there's so, a real reason why the, the the lungs are wider at the basis, and that's because that's the zone for your maximum amount of oxygenation. There you go. That's right. The clue is in the design. <laughs> of course, of course, we're very so, cleverly designed. Yeah, I mean, there's lots of reasons why people might adopt mouth breathing, like you've said, or uh, or shallow, rapid breath. Um, you know, anxiety. It's actually Anxiety Awareness Month this April. Did you know that? I had seen. I'd seen that you'd post that on a few, oh, I did, yeah. a few different platforms. Um, <laughs> so yeah. you know, and that, and and so this can be something that drives us to uh, to use the breath in a particular fashion, isn't it? And and, and it's that. I think last time we talked about saber tooth tigers and evolution, and, oh, yeah, and it yeah. is very much that that constant levels of stress. Mm. Um, I read recently that that um, one of the things that there's a gentleman called Nestor who's looked at done a book called Breathe, which is quite interesting. And on his journey into discovering about how to breathe, he he went around some weird and wonderful places, including the catacombs of Paris. Mm -hmm. And what they were doing was looking at the skulls and looking how the skull shape had changed with the transition into industrialized civilization and how back then the, the whole facial structure was a lot broader and wider because mm -hmm. historically people nasal breathed. But because of the increase of technology and all the, the blue screens and all that kind of stuff, our facial shapes have actually changed during industrialized society. I, I can't. Remember. I was looking for another piece of evidence for this, but because I've read it somewhere, but I couldn't remember where. Where they mm. talked about that our breathing rates have increased since the nineteen fifties. Oh. Um, I've read it once. I've, I've not been able to find the reference again. But again, that fits in very much with the technology changes in diet. You know, the, there's a whole wealth of things that, that are having a, a negative or a devolutionary de effect on us. Yeah. Um, yeah, well, I was talking interestingly to a singing singing teacher earlier this week, and it was after the broadcast actually that we were, you know, chatting as you do, and uh, and she was talking about the uh, the young people that she works with, and how the uh, the sort of tech posture, if you want to call it that, much as yeah, I know, <laughs> much as the tech companies try to deny there is such a thing. Um, you know, she was saying that the, the head forward posture is just putting the breathing apparatus into such yeah. a disadvantageous uh, yeah. orientation. And she was saying to me, what on earth can I do to get these young, you know, it was the young people that were, you know, even worse than those of us who might not be quite so young. But I, I've seen that the estimate of children with mouth breathing strategies now is about 50%. Wow, and, and of course that's going to be possibly magnified now because of the advent of technology and the rest of it. You know, one of the things that has now started to be starting to pick up. We, we talk about sleep apnea. Mm. People are now talking about screen apnea, oh. where people are doing emails or whatever and actually holding their breath whilst they're mm. actually doing it. You know, so we are getting to that stage where people are apneic whilst doing day-to-day -day activities. You know. The, the yeah. fundamental thing is if you, if you are if you're mouth breathing during the day you're going to guarantee pretty much you're going to mouth breathe at night and that leads into whole things in terms of sleep disturbances and if you get your sleep disturbed because you're breathing ineffectively and you're snoring or whatever mm. that's going to affect how you feel for the next day 
And if that happens repeatedly, that's going to affect how well you work through your life. Mm. And, and, you know, it isn't something that we necessarily uh, are aware of. Uh, you, you know, you, you, uh, you don't necessarily walk around looking at thinking about how you are breathing, for instance. It's, yeah. it's so automatic for us that, that we give it barely a thought. And maybe on occasion you notice that you haven't taken a breath for a while. <laughs> When you know when you're in growth. Are we speaking personally, are we here, Philippa? What? Sorry. Are we speaking personally? Are we? Is this a personal observation? Yeah, I do. Yes, exactly. When I'm in growth, I, I find yes. myself holding my breath. Yeah. Um, actually, you know what? I kind of pride myself on being able to swim a length without breathing. <laughs> <That's>... <laughs> Which I mean, means, there are occasions when that's, you know, breath holding is, is not a bad thing, of course. Completely. And, yeah. and you know, and, and that for me is, is, is once you've established your normal patterns of breathing and you want to challenge yourself by doing that kind of stuff, because, you know, there are proponents like Wim Hof and Severson mm -hmm. that use breath holding for a particular effect. Mm -hmm. But the thing I would come back to is they're, they're particular practitioners who have very good breathing control. Mm -hmm. they, they, what they're doing, particularly in terms of how they do their breath hold strategies, and, and, the, on, and it's particularly in Wim Hof, his over-breathing, mm -hmm. his over-breathing is a strategy to kick into his sympathetic nervous system. So why for most of us, whilst we're, we're, we're generally, generally on sympathetic overflow because of the nature of our lives, they're being generally stressful, he uses that for a different effect. He's doing mm -hmm. that mindful way to, to get a particular effect so that he can do some of the phenomenal bonkers things that he has done to show how breathing can influence our lives yeah i think um, that's it so so this was this is it where on the continuum do we fall um at, you know from dysfunction at one end to uh, uh, uh athletic performance at the other end really yeah. isn't it so yeah, of course it is. Uh, and we're all somewhere on this continuum, but uh, you know, to to go from uh, we, we're sitting at the dysfunctional end, uh, you know, and I and I kind of uh, experienced this with yoga because yoga does uh, speak to the breath. We do coach people in br various breath techniques, but if what we're doing is layering what might be considered an advanced breathing technique on top of what is actually a suboptimal starting yeah. point yeah you know then this is when this is when it starts to become uh, challenging and of course you know as therapists we are uh you know we work with people to from where they happen to begin on this journey so we assess people and we uh we make an evaluation so you know we can't really give out uh, specific advice to people but there are some general principles that people can you know think about in their own lives and maybe use some particular techniques so I do hope that we can give people some suggestions about things that might be beneficial I, I, I think sort of um, the, the not having done assessments and, and bearing in mind some of the issues that people have mm. The key, the two key things that I would do is is probably um, the the nose and blocking oh, because yeah. that's a very easy strategy yeah. uh, and um, unilateral nasal breathing because yeah. uh, the thing for me is yes we can talk about the stuff in terms of the thoracic spine and the rib cage the challenge around that is for some people that is going to be very very uncomfortable and if mm. it's too uncomfortable mm -hmm. you actually need people like yourself and myself. Um, to actually show modifications for that. Mm -hmm. um, we can talk about the general principles about, mm -hmm. you know, in an ideal world, he says, he's, I'm going to stand up, so I don't know if this is going to work or not. In an ideal world, what we're after is that the breathing comes from here and that those ribs come out in that kind of direction. But to do that, this part, so the, the top part down to just below your lower back, they that needs to be mobile because if it's not mobile if the if your spine's not mobile your ribs won't be mobile oh. and those ribs work in a particular way that helps that diaphragm sink down yeah that's um, right so there are lots of techniques that that 
we use as uh, as, as, as physiotherapists to help patients mobilize those. Mm. But, I, but I think that you know what I'd want is that they're really simple principles, and you can look online and look in books. But I, I just think that that actually the, there are a couple more fundamental, simpler things that we can get people doing that that, that are far lower risk and at oh. least people access to actually this thing taking in the air better mm -hmm. because that's the route of entry do you need a tissue just by the way do i need one no no, no i mean one. just one i don't one, I don't. one may need a tissue afterwards <laughs> oh. um, i mean the, 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 this, the key thing in terms of the nose and blocking is is that it's a a, a really easy exercise and it works quite well okay. um the only thing around that is is that um don't do it if you're pregnant or you've got high blood pressure. You know, those are the two caveats around that as an exercise. Right. And it's it's really, really simple. And that's the beauty of all, all the techniques I try to use with patients are really, really simple because it's not about me as a clinician watching them do them. It's about them having an understanding about why they need to do them and that they're really, really simple. Mm -hmm. It's like the session today that I did one of the patients is, was just trying to get her away from sparrow breathing and just actually understanding that by just breathing gently through her nose, her shoulders were going to go as opposed to, you know, because her whole breathing stuff and she was struggling with fatigue. Um, she, she wasn't a COVID patient. She was just one of the patients that we have that's been struggling with fatigue and has a dysfunctional breathing pattern her breathing rate was generally about 20 breaths per minute, which is quite high. Mm. But what we did with her was do some stuff to get her rib cage moving quite naturally and normally, then get her to do something we call beach pose breathing, which is literally just lying on your back with your hands behind your head and just getting her to focus on literally box breathing. Mm. Because she got the concept of box breathing, her breathing rate came down to about eight breaths a minute. Oh, yeah. Which is a significant energy saving you know if you're taking 20 breaths every minute 324 hours a day 365 days a day, that's a lot of energy you're wasting that means you don't then have that energy to do other things yeah yeah and this so, you know this kind of condition you know you're talking about dysfunctional breathing uh that people might have this uh, propensity for is something that wouldn't necessarily show on any investigations that you would have. Uh, you've got a very real symptom, i.e., yeah. you know, the fatigue and uh, maybe some shortness of breath or, you know, whatever goes along with that. But uh, you come to the doctor and you go and have a whole barrage of tests and, uh, you know, chances are there'll be nil found. And, and that then becomes very frustrating both mm. for the, the patient and, and the doctor. Mm. And, you know, there was a, a paper done mid-century last year by Claude Lum called Tip of the Iceberg, mm. where they talk about the, the patient that has this, this broad spectrum of different kinds of symptoms. And um, because you might mention, you know, my heart feels like it's racing, I feel like I've got palpitations all the time. So the sense a cardiac specialist who mm. then I can say no everything's fine mm -hmm. you'll then get and say that oh, i feel short of breath so they're going to see a, a respiratory specialist well then no absolutely everything's fine and sometimes it's just about joining up the dots to actually mm -hmm. find out what's doing it and and for me you know one of the fundamental things that i've learned on my 20 odd years of doing this is that the breathing is the bit that links this all together yeah because of the physiological effects that having a poor breathing pattern has Having what did you say? Poor breathing pattern, the impact of poor, poor breathing, poor breathing pattern. pattern. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And something that, uh, you know, even doctors are not necessarily aware of. No. Uh, as a sort of pathology, if you want to call it that. No. They're, yeah. they're, bizarrely, I, I suspect because of the impact that COVID's had, is, is that is... Uh, becoming increasingly aware you've only got to look at all the debates that's going on in terms yeah. of long covid and the impact of long covid and the yeah. shortness of breath is one of the common features within it um it, it's just a very difficult pathway because there are lots of different opinions about what is effective in terms of the treatment of long covid uh, and i think it's 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 
difficult to put that all in one box because that mm -hmm. doesn't necessarily fit everybody. And it's about taking a individualized approach to people's needs. Mm -hmm. You know, we have a, well, our particular population is one that have a, a high operational effectiveness and they have to be operationally fit. So we have to introduce some degree of exercise to actually get these people back to a place where they, they can actually do their job. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, we've got lots of experience working with post-viral uh, illnesses prior to COVID mm -hmm. and exercise programs did work for them, which is something that's a little bit contrary to the NICE guidelines because they've looked at the stuff around ME and say that, that generally these programs Greater programs don't work for patients. For our patient population, because they are very, very individualized and they're very much supported in terms of how that is actually delivered, because we have exercise specialists, the effects we're seeing is, is, is slightly different from the, the general population. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think that really applies across the board, though. The idea that we take a gen, a, a, an individualized approach, take the whole person, the mind body connection, you know, the whole piece of the puzzle into yep. consideration when developing uh, a, a, a intervention. And, and, you know, the, the difficulty is that the systems in place don't always allow for that to happen, you know, with ease anyway. Yeah, and, and I think that's 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 the really really big issue. Mm -hmm. in, in that um, I'm really looking. I work in in an interdisciplinary team, so mm -hmm. it's not just me as a physio. We've got OTs, we've got exercise re rehabilitation experts, we've got dietitian access, we've got mm -hmm. psychology access, and if needs be, we can work together at the same time with the patient, mm -hmm. which is 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 not un unique, but it's yeah. unique. We can do that with all of our patients. And across the UK, you can't always do that. So mm -hmm. I think that's where it gets challenging. Anyway, we digress away from breathing. Go on then. <laughs> I'm interested to know more about, uh, what did you call it, the nostril clearing? Yeah, nose, nose, nose clearing exercise. Okay. It's really, really simple. All it involves is uh, a gentle breath in and out through your nose. Mm -hmm. And you pinch your nose. And you can either nod but keeping your breath held, or you can rock from side to side, okay? What, my whole just, body or just my your head? Your whole body, yeah. Oh. And you just hold your breath for as long as you can. Okay. And then you go back to nasal breathing. All right, okay. I'll, I'll do that now then. Count, talk me through it. Okay, so gentle breath in, gentle breath out, pinch your nose, hold your breath, and nod. And you just carry on nodding or moving from side to side for as long as you can until you feel a moderately strong need to breathe. When you have that need to breathe, just breathe through your nose. So, uh, mouth closed, that... breathe through your nose. <laughs> breathe through your nose. Don't laugh. Laughing didn't work. Oh, yeah. I feel like I might need a tissue. <laughs> What you would do is give yourself a minute going back to nasal breathing yeah. that five or six times. And, and that in itself, just what you're doing is you get the CO2 to build up within your system. So you, A, you, you, you're developing some CO2 tolerance. You're improving that as a fact. But you're also warming up the airways and all that kind of stuff. That just results in those airways opening up. Because yeah, do you know? Do you know what? Um, because of being, uh, you know, here in the front of this camera with you, uh, much as you know, I, I like you and everything. Uh, still, there's a degree of, uh, you know, stress and anxiety that goes along with it. And uh, interestingly, I, you know, I was feeling a bit, uh, you know, like this with the breath. But I, it, incredibly, just that one. Uh, that one repetition made a, a noticeable difference to how to how that felt, the air entry and everything. Yeah. Yeah. So that's that's you know this is the thing that these things don't have to take hours and hours to for you to have a, a, a difference that you can perceive. So um, yeah, I mean, I really. So how many times did you say? You, you do it five or six times with a yeah. minute between each. Yeah. What I would say is is that. If after you've done your breath hold, you're really struggling, then you've held your breath for too long. Yeah, you're looking yeah. for a moderately strong drive to breathe, 
but not, oh my God, I've got to take another massive breath. Be because then you, you all you're going to do is then yeah. breathe off all that carbon dioxide. So yeah. it's about improving those CO2 levels, but then being able to go back and control your breathing. Uh, what does Patrick call it? Uh, oxygen hunger? Is Does he call it that? Yeah, or? it is basically oxygen hunger. But it's, yeah. it's that drive within the, the receptors, yeah. the, the, the CO2 receptors and oxygen receptors that are saying, you now need to breathe. This is yeah. wrong. And, and, and sometimes it's about having the confidence that, no, this is just a period of readjustment. I'm trying to readjust my tolerance to oxygen and CO2. Yeah. It's a rebalance. It, in, in essence, what you're trying to do is get to a, a new homeostatic balance. Yeah. And I think, so it is ox oxygen hunger. We're not starving. We're just, we're just hungry. No. <laughs> your, your, your body won't let you starve. Well, I know, but you know what I mean. Where yeah, yeah. you but know, some people are like, "Oh, hang on, I I must hold my breath for you know sixty seconds," or it becomes yeah. a competition. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Whereas, yeah. Uh, and people can cheat. Oh, you know, and this is one of the things about it. It's about being honest with yourself in terms mm -hmm. of, you know. How long can I actually hold my breath for? Uh, and, by, and by a similar token, the same sort of thing with whilst you're out and about and walking, mm. you may well find that, that actually to do your nasal breathing initially, it might be easier to do it walking downhills because the loads aren't as high. Yes, you load from a physio perspective, you're loading your knees more because you're working eccentrically. But from a breathing perspective, it's easier to walk down a hill than it is on the flat or up hills. So in some ways, that's a really nice way of grading your exercise. So that whilst you're walking downhill, right, I'm walking downhill, what I'm going to do now is just try and concentrate on breathing through my nose. Yeah. When I'm walking uphill, I need to use every hole available. And it's just looking at that balance in terms of from that perspective. Um, did I mention my other half last time in terms of that she she struggled with Ray nose really, really badly? Oh, you did, yeah. Yeah. So um, she had such bad symptoms that unpacking shopping and putting it in the freezer, by the time she had done a couple of bags, her hands were white. Uh, and with the lockdown, what we've been doing, we've been doing pretty much like yourself, using using our time together to go and do the walking. And I got her to concentrate on doing nasal breathing. Mm. And um since july last year she hasn't had a single episode of ray notes even doing the crazy. shopping even, even doing the shopping oh. you know, she used to get in the car in the morning and her hands would go white yeah and this has completely changed and the only thing we've done that's been any different has been the breathing education Ooh, because about it, by increasing those co2 levels you get vasodilation mm. So it's opening up those those small black fine yeah, yeah. give I mean, it that heat. If you think about it, that uh, closing down in the periphery of the blood vessels is again a stress. Of, sort of, of course it is, isn't it? So shallow breathing, yeah, and uh, yeah, that's interesting because uh, I I often have cold hands, so I'm going to work on that one. I am. <laughs> Another nice little technique, which you will be more familiar with, is the unilateral nasal breathing. Oh, yes. Anuloma viloma in yoga speak. <laughs> I bow to your expertise on that one. But, it, but again, it, it's just a really nice way because one of the things that a lot of people say is, yeah, well, I've, I've got deviated septum, I've got a broken nose, yada, yada. Mm. Yeah, okay, we all do. Yeah, mine's, mine's playing rugby. <laughs> I, I can do it. And a really nice way of just seeing if you have the ability to do it is what's called a cotter's maneuver. So if you just put put your fingers either side of your nose there and just yeah. pull that apart and just see how that feels to breathe through your nose. Oh, is that that'll be like what those nose strips do for you, won't it? It, it is a little bit. A little but bit. the theory is is that if you're mouth breathing, the muscles that help support this and keep it open like any muscle are deconditioned so by doing that what you're doing is you improve the opportunity for that nasal breathing to start working well i definitely felt that that opened the nasal passageways uh more than uh, prior to doing that so yeah that's interesting that's, that's a nice additional thing just to give people reassurance that they can actually do this and that you know, they have the opportunity. 
what I would say is that if they do it and they and it doesn't feel any different, then maybe they need to go and see their doctor to clear them to make sure they haven't got polyps or anything mm. like that. But it's mm. providing a, a, a proper restriction. Mm. Yeah. But going back to the unilateral nasal breathing, that's a really mm. nice way of actually just trying to learn how to get that nasal airway working. Mm. Um, the thing I, we mentioned last time is that the, the nose works on a shift pattern. In a shift pattern? Yeah. So if you go... And then compare it to the other side. One side's blocked, the other side's clear. Yeah. One's basically on a cleaning cycle, the side that's blocked, and the other side is actually doing the, the breathing part. Do okay. they all take it in turns? Yes, they take it in turns. They take it in shift. Basically, what happens is the side that's blocked up, what you're doing is giving a little fine hair, a little cilia in there that's responsible for clearing all the gunk out. You're giving them a chance to recover. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So if you if people check it now and then check it in a couple of hours, they probably feel that there is different air entry. But you can use the nasal unilateral nasal breathing to actually try and and improve that and just get your nose used to actually getting air entry. Um, the problem with doing nasal nasal breathing outside when it's really really cold is it's really messy and you will mm -hmm. need to, use, mm -hmm. you know, and and but that's normal. Hmm. That's no different from you going for a run and your legs ache afterwards. Your nose is just not used to doing it. And if you just persist with it and take plenty of tissues, your nose will adapt to it and get used to it. Yeah. I, I mean, I, you know, I'm, I'm not, a, I always have a tissue handy, put it that way. So, uh, so the alternate nostril breathing we've established uh we've established by doing this that yeah. i have the capacity to breathe through my nostrils and so it's safe to proceed with the alternate nostril breathing and yeah. um and i know i know how we would do this in yoga but uh do you have a you know are we no are we absolutely completely the same so uh -huh. Blocking off once. I, I probably don't do it with the yoga hand technique like some people <laughs> would. Um, but, you know, it is literally breathing through one side. Change over. Breathe out through the other. Breathe through that side. The advice is generally to always finish on the left-hand side. Oh. Apparently according to the yoga yoga text that i've read um you can put a hold on it as well i have um some of the the yoga stuff that i've done um mm -hmm. they do introduce a hole which in some ways is actually going to help you with the carbon dioxide levels and the rebalance mm -hmm. of that so that's something that people can try but again these are really easy simple techniques with that are, are are low risk but they give you the opportunity to start breathing differently Mm. Or breathing quietly i i do like that idea of breathing less is breathing more mm. that, that you are breathing less actually has more of a beneficial effect yeah 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 that i mean it it makes perfect sense once you start to dig beneath the the science um yeah so we so we would um we would do alternate nostrils and think of the wave yep. or to begin with and then incorporate the square, perhaps with so the the breathing on the square is. Uh, you, I mean, I don't know where you start. We'll I'll start here. Uh, in an inhalation, followed by a hold, followed by an exhalation, followed by a hold. Yeah. So. Yeah. So in spiritual and expiratory pauses, which you know from from you look at all the the respiratory physios ideals which which i'm not they do talk about the importance of respiratory holds and expiratory holds so you, you know the the it, it's something that that i would use as a technique particularly if patients were really really struggling in terms of how much they were breathing just to try and introduce that the the challenge would be around those where their symptoms in terms of dysfunctional breathing are quite high so one of the things is a nine megan oh, and score on that is 23 if we've got patients that are scoring really really high in terms of in the 30s or 40s they're probably going to really struggle with breath holds because mm -hmm. they're their co2 in, insensitivity so mm -hmm. you might need to adapt that and initially just get them to breathe in and out and actually just try and get them to relax with the breathing in and out before you go into proper 
Yeah. So that, you know, that the, there is always a progression to yeah. be had and, uh, and definitely start at the beginning. The beginning is always a good place to start. <laughs> Um, but it, yeah, I mean, you know, we we are now opening up. Uh, we're getting out and about a bit more, and some of us have had the vaccine, and some haven't. Um, uh, you know, breathing through the nostrils provides us with protection uh, in terms of uh, filtering out the particles and also this nitric oxide uh, element, and uh, and holding your breath. I did, uh, I did hear Patrick advocate that if you were on public transport and somebody happened to, uh, to cough in the space that you were uh, inhabiting, to, uh, to hold your breath briefly and definitely breathe through the nostrils. Um, so, you know, these are good skills to have. Definitely. Definitely. <laughs> if, uh, you know, if we are out in the pub garden or wherever we happen to be uh, making a beeline for Primark or I don't know. So, <laughs> so yeah, joking apart, the, these are very handy skills to have at our disposal. And, um, and therapeutic uh, also, in fact, uh, you know, as you say, so uh, thank you so much again for a very educational, uh, an educational session. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I mean, this is a journey. We're all on a journey. We're all trying to learn more uh, about more about our own bodies and, uh, and more about how to care for ourselves. Well, that is the hope anyway. So thank you so much for some really sound, science and uh, and some uh, easy approachable techniques that people can just begin to explore and then if there are, if there is a desire to dive deeper into any of these topics then um, you and I are around to uh, troubleshoot and uh, take questions if uh, if there indeed are any more so thank you again Gwyn it's great My pleasure. take care now thank you bye now.